So hopefully that will continue by the end of my school. Okay, so I'm going to put the exercise recommendations in at least for houses of what's new. And I'd like to review the recommendations for competitive sports that are directly applicable, hopefully, to your daily practice, encompassing not only the cardiomyopathies and the commonest causes of sudden cardiac death from in heart muscle disorders, but also myocarditis, which is an increasingly common problem that is, that, that, that is facing us. I'm talking about ischemic heart disease in the competitive athletes, and another common condition that we do come across, a group of conditions, but in particular, focusing on aortic valves towards the end of the tour. I'd also like to talk about the interaction between the genotype positive and phenotype negative individual, and I'll explain a bit more about that further on, and describe the recommendations both on this side of the pond and over in the USA, because there are some discrepancies along the way. Don't worry, Donald Trump wasn't involved in any of those. So if one considers the demographics of the largest case series worldwide of sudden cardiac death in young athletes, it becomes apparent that the most common causes are cardiomyopathies and other inherited conditions, as well as structural congenital problems and infectious and degenerative causes. And that's, that's what we're going to discuss. It's well established now that athletes with an inherited underlying problem do have a substrate for a potentially fatal arrhythmia and are twice as likely to suffer a cardiac arrest than non-athletic individuals who are affected with the same condition. And there are a variety of triggers for this, including dehydration, adrenergic surges associated with the athlete's milieu, electrolyte imbalances, and also acid-base disturbances as well. And any of these can act on this underlying substrate in order to potentiate a fatal arrhythmia. And based on this link between exercise and sudden death, as I've highlighted, two main sets of recommendations for participation in competitive sport have been proposed in athletes with cardiovascular disease. And these are circumstantial and more consensus-based rather than law binding but given the un unexpected and unpredictable outcomes and the nature of these events of sudden cardiac arrest, the, the net that we cast out there has to be quite broad in order to encompass all preventative deaths, and that's what the aim of these recommendations are. Now, the top ones are the European ones, which were back in 2005-2006, which are currently due to be updated, but the Americans have got their first, having just released their set of updated guidelines just a few months ago and we'll be diving into the pertinent features and the differences between the two. We also must bear in mind, when considering exercise recommendations, the classification that has been allowed to, uh, that has been developed to allow, whether it's reasonable to recommend an athlete with a specific cardiovascular abnormality be eligible for a particular sport. And, and the initial classification along the x-axis can be um, composed of uh, uh, dynamic components, um, which is more your isotonic type exercises, and then along the y-axis is the static components, the isometric type of exercises, and these are opposite um, poles of a, of a continuum, with most sports having a combination of the two. But it's important to bear in mind those that are at the top end of high dynamic and high static components, and this one A group that we will come back to refer to, including that very popular sport boards, um, bowling, curling, golf, riflery. I think there'll be some who've worked with T20 cricket recently who may actually argue that cricket perhaps doesn't fall into this category, and I would probably tend to agree. But generally speaking, in order to categorize various sports and exercise movements, we just have to bear this in mind. As we've heard, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is an autosomal dominant condition. It's very heterogeneous in its clinical presentation. It's usually familiar with over half of cases now having a sarcomeric mutation that can be identified, up to 60 to 70 percent now. And the hallmark is left ventricular hypertrophy, histologically defined with myocardial disarray. And looking at the recommendations, well, if an athlete has a definitive diagnosis of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy plus risk factors, including syncope, a first degree relative who's affected, 
or any documented evidence of high-grade rhythm disturbances such as ventricular tachycardia, ESC recommend no competitive score. However, the Americans say that actually these very low dynamic, low static sports are okay in a controlled environment. And those individuals who have a definitive diagnosis of HCM but have a very low risk profile or have a borderline diagnosis are actually allowed to have these class 1A low dynamic, low static um, sports. Uh, and that goes for the Americans as well. But what about those who've got the gene yet have no clinical manifestation of the condition, i.e. this could be a family relative of an affected individual, for instance. That is where there is some discrepancy. So in contrast to the American guidelines, the ESC are more restrictive, and given that natural history of such individuals is actually largely unknown. And all competitive sports are excluded, and only non-competitive or leisure time sporting activities are recommended. And these are based on the hypothesis that regular exercise may have a role in potentiating some cellular, underlying cellular mechanism leading to a HCM phenotype in the presence of a genetic predisposition, be that through left ventricular hypertrophy or a tachyarrhythmia. But at present, the risk for sudden death in these gene positive phenotype negative individuals is extremely low and appears to be no different from those in the general population. And that's the tact that the Americans have adopted meaning genotype positive and phenotype negative individuals can participate in all sports, albeit under surveillance. And the other coronary that I'm going to discuss is ARVC. Again, genetically determined with an autosomal dominant inheritance pattern, but incomplete penetrance. And, and its characteristic hormone is thyrofatal replacement of the myocardium. These um, Myocardial, um, these myocytes have uh, cardiac desmosomes between them, which are specialized adhesion junction molecules, and in a symmetrical group of proteins that provide this mechanical connection between them. And when they are subject to, to stresses, or if there's, an, uh, if there's an underlying mutation, then that can lead to detachment of these myocytes and eventually further fatty infiltration with a clinical picture that can result in sudden cardiac death in nearly half of cases. Again, this genotype phenotype interaction comes to the fore, and it's more complex in ARVC perhaps than HCM. With exercise shown to play a fundamental role in unmasking this phenotype, there have been neural models that have shown increased penetrance um, and arrhythmic risk in gene positive tires, and that's been translated to the track side with gene positive athletes um, um, who've unmasked the phenotype earlier. And this highlights an important link between exercise and the outcomes of mutation positive ARVC patients and family members, which are particularly relevant to the athletes. And in line with this, if there's a definitive diagnosis of ARVC, then the ESC say no competitive sport, and they also advise no competitive sport for borderline diagnoses of ARVC. However, the Americans do allow the first 1A low dynamic, low static sports. The last year alone has seen a plethora of papers which have demonstrated that endurance exercise in particular is associated with a lower age of presentation, a higher risk of ventricular tachycardia, and more rapid progression to heart failure in patients with ARVC and also in gene positive carriers. So, in this group of individuals who don't have any symptoms or risk factors for sudden death, the ESC recommend recreational sports only and annual surveillance, whereas the Americans do say that these um, individuals can partake in the Class 1A sports with annual follow-up. And it should be noted that the ESC are currently revising their guidelines and perhaps adopting a less conservative approach, although taking the evidence on board. And moving on to myocarditis. Now, this is an inflammatory heart muscle condition, which is a diagnosed by established histological and immunological criteria characterized by myocardial degeneration and necrosis in the absence of ischemia. And there are a variety of causes, both infective and non-infective. And the ones in red 
are perhaps more pertinent to the young athletic individual and should be borne in mind. Again, myocarditis is a cause of sudden cardiac death in athletes, affecting those usually under the age of 40 and predominantly in males. And another case series of nearly 400 athletes showed that 5.2% died from a, uh, from a typical presentation of myocarditis. An athlete in particular seems to be at risk with this condition after exhaustive exercise with persistent overtraining. There's a large immune, that there's a big immune response with susceptibility to respiratory infections, which has been well established, um, with activation of the T lymphocytes and natural killer cell systems. And then there's increased viral replication as well, especially in the early phase of exercise within myocytes, leading to cytolysis, and an enhanced immune response in the athletes, which can lead to inflammation and necrosis, and then even fibrosis. And the MRI is usually the gold standard as far as imaging goes, with characteristic alterations in T2 and T1 weighted imaging, and the presence of gadolinium in up to 90% of acute phases, which has been noted, uh, which has been noted in the sub-epicardial areas. One should also bear in mind the role of, of course, the ECG and the echocardiogram. But prognosis is important because in 50% of cases, the myocarditis is usually re resolved within a month. Yet a quarter may go on to develop cardiac dysfunction and the remainder have quite a poor prognosis with some even requiring heart transplantation. But when we see these patients, although biopsy is the gold standard, it's not very practical and both the patients and their trainers are reluctant for the individual to undergo that, but bedside tests such as the ECG, echocardiography, biomarkers, especially troponin, and exercise treadmill tests and halter monitoring should all be used in the primary assessment, followed by an MRI. Now, the appearance of gadolinium affects what we do because if there is no gadolinium, then one can be re-evaluated, usually three to six months later, after which the initial acute phase seems to have subsided. However, Six months later, for those who have demonstrated any previous abnormality or have gadolinium enhancement, a enhancement, a six-month re-evaluation is advised. And again, the initial tests are recommended at that re-evaluation. And if the gadolinium has regressed or improved, then that patient or that athlete may be deemed eligible again for sport according to a tailored exercise regime. However, if the gadolinium persists, that is still is a great a, a gray zone where we don't really have much evidence as to what, what, what are on any outcomes in athletes. Although it's difficult to advocate then go back into a highly intense exercise regime, then six months of reevaluation again is ideal. And the ESC do you say that usually six months. After the initial insert, one can return to the field dependent on freedom of symptoms and normal bedside tests. The OCC, however, adopt, it, the, the message is still the same, that normalization of serum markers in particular and um, any further functional testing as well. So, Moving on to ischemic heart disease in the athletes. Now, this accounts for most of sudden cardiac death, as we heard from Dr. Madoni, in the older athletes. So it's important to establish risk factors involving ischemic heart disease and those who want to exercise, along with the usual clinical evaluations. And that's important because you don't know if you're going to be dealing with a Ronaldo-type situation or an Anil Malhotra type situation at the other end of the spectrum. So it's important to establish a variety of baseline factors when assessing an athlete's risk of ischemic heart disease. And the reason is that you can trigger coronary events, especially during transient vigorous physical activity, with increased acrylaminergic surges and increased likelihood of thrombosis. And of course, our baseline investigations should be carried out, ECG, echocardiography, and even a functional test, and other um, more investigative um, options can be taken as well when required. But in order to risk stratify, 
There are some factors associated with lower adverse risk of events, including normal systolic function and a good exercise capacity, and no induced for ischemia, the absence of any high grade rhythm disturbances, or significant coronary artery disease. However, a high risk athlete may be someone who demonstrates a low ejection fraction, reduced exercise capacity with ischemic symptoms, and functional evidence of this as well, and the presence of high grade rhythm disturbances, or coronary disease that is deemed significant. And according to the guidelines, if you're low risk, then one can participate in moderate dynamic and low static sports for, in both places, Europe and America. But if you're high risk, then you're deemed not to compete, you're advised not to compete in any competitive sports. According to the European guidelines, they're then low dynamic and low static sports according to the Americans. And I'll just put another picture of this mutual classification so we can come back to our 1A box, which is the bottom left, and the 1B, which is, um, which is baseball, softball, and those sorts of activities. So the key points of, for athletes with ischemic heart disease is to be aware that they may actually even play down their own symptoms, and they're also silent markers. For example, a reduced ability of, of that individual to keep up with their teammates or unusual symptoms of shortness of breath that it's just not your usual associated you know, chest pain that they may come to you and, and, and report. So there are other subtleties to be aware of. And athletes with recent events should cease competition until complete recovery, be it a stent, which would require up to four weeks of recovery, or even coronary artery bypass surgery as well. And, Things like wound care and skin and even need to be taken into consideration. And they should then undergo risk stratification again. Most importantly, with risk factor modification and secondary prevention. And I'd like to just finish on talking about the aortic valve because that is something that we do get asked and we do come across in our clinical practice as well. Um, a bad risk for the aortic valve can account for up to 2% of the athletic population with aortic stenosis accounting for 4% of sudden cardiac deaths in young athletes. And it's important to emphasize history and examination, which seem to be being the most common cause, but also breathlessness and angina presenting at a later, more advanced stage. And then echocardiography, and there's certain criteria that are used on echo that can help differentiate whether the aortic stenosis is mild, moderate, or severe. And then there's also aortic regurgitation, to be considered, which may be because of a bad custody or so rather than eccentric jet, Marfan syndrome, the connective tissue disorder, or idiopathic or hypertension related dilatation of your aortic root. And in athletes with aortic stenosis, again, the Europeans are slightly more conservative than American counterparts, and if it's mild aortic stenosis, there's a low moderate dynamic or and low moderate static sports that are advised, whereas the Americans allow any sport, advise I should say, any sport. Moderate aortic stenosis has low dynamic, low static components, but no competitive sports. Whereas the Americans do allow that, as long as there's been good exercise capacity demonstrated on functional testing, such as an, a, a, a treadmill with no ST depression and, and symptoms. And then severe aortic stenosis is a no-go with the Europeans. But again, the Americans do say they're asymptomatic, they allow low intensity sports, but symptomatic, they finally say no. And that encompasses the low moderates, i.e. the 2A box, and also the 2B boxes as well. So a slightly broader box than the previous ones that we were looking at. And then finally, aortic regurgitation seems to have a less conservative guidelines for both mild and moderate aortic regurgitation, although the Americans do go in slightly more detail, saying so that if there's a normal ejection function and only moderate left ventricular dilatation and good exercise capacity, then moderate aortic regurgitation is okay. Whereas severe aortic regurgitation, again, is allowed if there is no progression. And if your ejection fraction does start falling below 50%, or there's signs of left ventricular and systolic or end diastolic and dilatation in both males and females, then um, it's advised that the athlete should abstain from competitive sports. So in conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, exercise recommendations are useful 
for, um, for, for, for our practices as physicians in daily practice. They are restrictive in order to prevent sudden cardiac death, and the recommendations should be applied on an individual basis. And of course, throughout all of this, take into account the athlete's autonomy. Um, and there are more liberal guidelines, certainly by the Americans. I think the Europeans will follow suit with regards to the genotype positive, phenotype negative individuals. Thank you very much for your attention.